All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today. So today we have Michael delivering a talk for us. So Michael Thomas is a professor of cognitive neuroscience here at Birkbeck University of London. Uh, since 2010, he has been the director of the Centre for Educational Neuroscience. We are a cross-institutional research centre which aims to further translational research between neuroscience and education and establish new transdisciplinary accounts in the learning sciences. In 2003, he also established the Developmental Neurocognition Laboratory within Birkbeck's world-leading Centre for Brain and Cognitive Development. The focus of his lab is to use multidisciplinary methods to understand the brain and cognitive basis of cognitive variability, including neurodevelopmental conditions. And Michael has also recently published two new books, which you may have heard of, um, How the Brain Works with Simon Green and Educational Neuroscience, The Basics in collaboration with Kathy Rogers. Highly recommend have checking out both of those. Um, so today he's going to be giving us a very fascinating and relevant talk on climate change, education and neuroscience. Over to you, Michael. Thanks so much, Astrid, and thanks everyone for uh, attending the talk today. So let me share screen. The one. Does that look like a talk? That looks like a talk. It does, and it's working. Yes. Okay. So yes, um, today's talk a uh, slightly different from some of the previous educational neuroscience talks. So it's quite um, applied. Uh, I'm going to be talking about climate change, education, and neuroscience. Uh, this is a an overview of what I'll be talking about. So I'm going to give a little bit of background about the relevance of the the uh of the topic today and and how i got into it um and then um i'm, I'm gonna kind of come at the question from three different directions i'm going to talk a little bit about how climate change and sustainability uh is um appearing in um uh, the curriculum and some of the new initiatives from the Department for Education um, in the UK uh, in that regard. Then I'm going to try and establish the relevance of neuroscience uh, to climate change debates. Um, and uh, I'm going to do that in two ways. First of all, I'm going to suggest that educational neuroscience can give us some insights about ways to teach content about climate change and sustainability. And then I'm kind of take a different perspective and um, look at what are the causes of, of human behavior and influences on human behavior that are relevant to climate change. And, and that'll have slightly different parts to it. I'll have an evolutionary perspective. I'll think a little bit about how the brain works uh, in that context and maybe a little bit of advice or, or suggestions um, for policy in that regard. Okay, so how I first got into climate change was kind of way back. I read this book in the uh, that was published in 1990 called Hot House Earth, which is really um, quite a scary book that we were destroying the planet, written by the journalist John Gribbin. And I have vivid memories of, of uh, sitting around the, the uh, dining table uh, with my parents, having read this book and, and thinking, oh my goodness, the adults have messed up the planet and, and feeling a sense of kind of betrayal and uh, uh, kind of grievance. Uh, sort of quite a, uh, I was an adolescent at that stage, so, so quite an adolescent response. Um, and in retrospect, a little, little bit unfair to my parents. I, I think you have to add in the previous maybe 50 generations uh, responsible to uh, for what we've done to the planet. So that was kind of the, the distant context um but then more recently as um astrid mentioned um i uh, had this book out with simon green where we were giving a, a sort of a, a overview of how that how the brain functions that that's relevant to psychology and when we were coming towards the end of this book writing the book we wanted to have a topic that kind of pulled together uh some of the themes of of the various functional components of the brain and and make it relevant to a uh, uh, um, a topic that's that, that's relevant today. So um, uh, we we pick climate change as as our topic there, and and as we say in the book, uh, 
let me see um when you can find ozone eating hydrochlorofluorocarbon gases in the heights of the stratosphere and microplastics in the depths of the mariana trench as a species you know you've made it okay so i guess in an educational context one of the pressing concerns for us is how we teach climate change and what might be the side effects um, of this uh, sort of um, political climate or uh, global climate um, causing anxiety in young people. So that's a paper I'm showing you there from Nature Mental Health last year, arguing that, that climate change anxiety is um, rife in, in young people. Uh, and part of that is linked to the media coverage. So I just picked a random story here from the BBC website. Thanks from 2022. Climate change, six tipping points likely to be crossed. And down under here, current rates of warming will put the Earth at risk of crossing dangerous climate change tipping points, according to a new analysis. Uh, um, why, a lot of use of scare quotes there. Uh, but you can see this is kind of slightly clickbaity and it's but it's anxiety inducing, right? Tipping points is all too late. Terrible things are going to happen. Corals are going to die. The little fishies are going to die. Um, it's that kind of context that that um, you can understand will induce anxiety in young people and uh, in many of us. On the other hand, uh, Actually, things aren't that bad. And there's a book just come out by um, Hannah Ritchie called Not the End of the World, where she goes through the various stats, the statistics, and uh, actually how much progress are we making. Um, and just to pull out some points, uh, if we had had no policies on climate change, changing our energy use and practices regarding uh biodiversity, we will be on target for a four to five degree increase um, in temperature. Um, but already the policies that are in place internationally would have us on target instead for 2.5 to 2.9 degrees. And um, OK, that's not the 1.5 that we're heading for, but still many other pledges of further policy uh, changes are in place. So yeah, changes are happening. There has been a much faster than expected move to low carbon sustainable economies. That's now more affordable because of technological development in solar and wind, such that the countries who haven't yet had a fossil fuel based uh, economy don't have to go through that stage. It's affordable for them to, to jump straight to sustainable energy use. Uh, the technology is accelerating for things like carbon uh, capture and methane capture and Sometimes the, the media doesn't give an accurate portrayal of the data. So you think lots of people are now dying from uh, flooding and heat waves and so forth. Actually, there's a much lower rate of death from natural disasters now uh, than in early in the 20th century. And peak uh, per capita CO2 emissions peaked in 2012. Already per head, we are emitting uh, less um, emissions. Uh, now, the population has been increasing, so the total amount has been increasing, but even the, the peak total emissions is in sight and will reduce. And part of that is technology. So our parents and grandparents, the, the technology they used in the houses they built in was so much less energy efficient than today. So positive changes there. Um, in the UK, we have a, a net zero carbon target and lots of policy initiatives have been happening around that. And you can download this app if you're interested, a free app, uh, CO2, uh, carbon, GB carbon grid. Um, and this just lists how much currently uh, the energy usage in the UK, where is it coming from? So when I started writing this talk this morning, uh, just over 50 percent was coming from gas, but uh, about 20 percent from wind and solar biomass we were nabbing a bit from france we had some nuclear but barely any uh coal contribution a little bit of um hydro by the time i finish the talk uh ah oh, the, the nation's energy usage had gone up a little bit but even less gas even more wind so it got a little bit windier so you can already see a lot of progress has been made 
um, in, in rebalancing our um, energy supplies in the UK. And Dina, I was talking to one climate change and sustainability policymaker who said to me uh, that she felt that, that when she watched climate change disaster movies, like 2012, um, that these are beginning to feel a bit dated. That that we are made a lot of progress, and it's not like every disaster movie starts with the government ignoring a scientist. No one's really ignoring the scientists, and there are a lot of government policy initiatives uh, uh, to move this forward. That's not to say uh, we don't need a lot more uh, policy. Sorry, political pressure. Uh, that's what's driving the progress. Uh, as the quote goes, the deer of democratic government only runs faster with the dogs of public opinion uh, at its heels. Uh, but now the going out on the street and waving a placard, it maintains the political pressure, but the solutions are really down now to implementation, such as agreeing international systems for carbon credits, putting in place national financial systems for domestic installation of solar panels and so forth. And we can see a, a lot of organizations are now starting up initiatives around uh, climate change and sustainability. So uh, over at uh, the um, Institute of Education at UCL, they have a Center for Climate Change and Sustainability Education. Birkbeck has just launched its own research center for environment uh, and sustainability. So increasing energy attention um, and initiatives in this area. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the to the next bit to look at um, education in particular around this area. And I'll just say that there have been a lot of initiatives from the UK Department for Education. Uh, this is a blog just before Christmas listing five of their recent steps, uh, appointing youth focal point, uh, so representatives for young people. Uh, about delivering on climate strategy, um, attending COP28 uh, to present um, the UK educational initiatives, developing climate action plans, uh, expanding the climate ambassador scheme, and uh, combining all of um, the school uh, grounds around the country and turning those into a national education nature park. The last of those um, is an initiative um, mainly with the uh, um, Natural History Museum um, that is working to uh, map, manage and enhance all the land across the education estate to create a single nature park and to enable the young people in schools to have the opportunity to connect to nature, to increase the biodiversity um, of those um, lands, to do things like um, change the planting, to make it more friendly for small animals or birds and so forth. And that, that gives uh, um, the children in the schools a real feeling of, of concrete application of um, sustainability and what they can actually do about it. And as part of that, I believe the government are launching a climate action award scheme in September, which is like the Duke of Edinburgh awards uh, with these multiple levels. And if you get to the gold level, you actually get assigned a mentor uh, um, from, this is, I think, in collaboration with the Royal Society to work with groups of, of um, sixth formers to develop projects around uh, um, sustainability and biodiversity. So a lot of those kinds of initiatives, those are bits I pulled off um, the uh, website for this project. But you can see one of the things they're doing that is there's, um, that the UK was presenting at, at COP28 that, that raised a lot of interest was geospatial mapping, the use of kind of satellite mapping to understand all the territories, all the ground, the land, and how it's being used. Uh, and believe it or not, all the education estates um, in the UK actually has a, a land mass that, that is twice the area of Birmingham, if you put all of those uh, schools together. Uh, part of that initiative is, um, uh, again, in, in combination with the Natural History Museum, to generate lots of materials um, that teachers can use um, in their lessons, be they individual materials to make particular points. Uh, so if you're doing maths and you want to teach about correlations, you can pull out some, some materials, some graphs about uh, correlations between CO2 emissions and global temperature, for example, 
but it also has whole units to teach about uh, climate change and sustainability. Uh, and importantly, it's not a politically mo um, driven resource. It's all data from um, NASA and uh, the Royal Society and the Metrolog Meteorological Office and, and so forth. Uh, there are projects that schools can get involved in. So this is another one, Nature Friendly Schools, uh, which is all about um, seeing if you can do outdoor learning. So outdoor classrooms uh, for certain activities. I think perhaps the, the most important initiative for the Department for Education as underway for, for actually addressing the problem rather than just teaching people about it is their Net Zero Accelerator program uh, where they're trying to uh, um, improve all the school buildings uh, to make them more fuel efficient to install solar panels and local wind generation and batteries. Uh, apparently, the education estate represents 36% of total UK public sector building emissions, and they're trying to turn that uh, down to net zero or even to enable schools to be local generators of uh, renewable energy. Uh, UK is actually quite a, a world leader in green technology and green skills. It, it hosted the first uh, green skills conference back in September. And uh, I think many countries are now competing to host this conference uh, going forward. So quite a lot of activities and, and some positivity around that. Um, if you're interested, uh, if you're in a school or a university and you're interested, what should you be doing as a responsible education organisation? The answer to that is twofold. You should be integrating climate science and sustainability into your course content and you should be walking the talk, uh, investing in sustainable technology and practices for your organization. So that's uh, solar panels on your roof, for example. Uh, looking just at Birkbeck, I had a look at what courses they had on offer in, in response to that, put put climate science content in, into your uh, uh, provision. So there is a, a, a master's in, in climate change um, offered by Burke. There, there's one on environment and sustainability. Uh, but if you look into that, they have a range of viewpoints considering science policy, social and economic perspectives. But uh, for today's talk, no neuroscience. OK, so that brings us on to the next part. What is the relevance of, of neuroscience uh, to this question? So my 13-year-old son um, did say to me, climate change and neuroscience, what have they got to do with each other? And and he he wanted personal recognition for having pointed that out. So there you go, Finbar, that's for you. Uh, and it's a good question. Neuroscience, you know, neural activity, how brain brains work, is, is that really going to be relevant to a global problem such as um, climate change? Well, if you go onto Wikipedia, uh, you can find something called environmental psychology. That's That's been around for quite a while. That does things such as look at um, na our natural environment and our built environment, how that uh, shapes us. It looks at social settings, learning environments, informational environments, and so forth. If you zip down that Wikipedia page, you will find things like uh, the psychology of um, connectedness to nature, things like personal space and territory. Um, they do claim that environmental psychology is interdisciplinary and there are some of the disciplines, developmental psychology, cognitive science, industrial, organizational psychology, psychobiology, even psychoanalysis. And there is a mention in there of um, social neuroscience. Uh, this was a paper published uh, about five years ago by uh, Ute Wolf and Hannah Lindeborg, where they um, talked about neuroscience and sustainability. And um, they were interested in, in undergraduate education. And they said, well, what kind of things could neuroscience uh, add to uh, undergraduate education on environmental sustainability? And they suggested things like pointing out the neurotoxicity of common chemicals, health dangers of, of anthropogenic sensory noise, um, the neural basis for value-based decision-making, um, neural and sensory responses to nature exposure, uh, and the health benefits of green experiences, so-called biophilia. But at the time, they also pointed out 
the term environmental neuroscience is pretty much unheard of or was at that point in, in terms of um, undergraduate education. So it's not really clear that environmental neuroscience exists. I had a little search. Are there any research labs doing that kind of thing? I found a couple. Uh, there's a, a, a lab, uh, the Berman Lab in um, uh, Chicago. They actually look like they're interested in climate change and sustainability research. Then there's the Lees Meitner Group um, that's in uh, Berlin, although their work seems to be more um, the sort of the built on natural environment rather than uh, climate science. Here's what I think potentially neuroscience could add. Um, two things. One is insights about how best to teach climate change and sustainability content. And second, insights into why we behave the way we do with respect to the global environment and then how to support people uh, to change their behaviours. So I'm going to start with the first of those, educational neuroscience and teaching climate change and sustainability. Uh, and in this, I'm going to lean quite heavily on um, some fantastic work from Paul Howard Jones, who works in this area and is a, a leading figure in educational neuroscience. This is a, a schematic of, of a, a, a heuristic that uh, Paul and his colleagues have, have suggested to, to help teachers think from an educational neuroscience perspective uh, about the teaching process, about it being an iteration of engaging the students in the content, building their knowledge of it, and then activities to consolidate that knowledge uh, and apply it to new situations. So um, I'm going to follow through that that um, engage, build, um, consolidate uh, cycle for the next few slides. So um, I'm going to give it a, an overview of um, a paper where I'll have to check with Paul about the status of this paper. I know he was about to um, submit it. So um, what I'm going to talk about probably isn't the, the final version. Um, but just to give a flavor of the ideas that that uh, Paul has been um, developing for the last few years. So he, he talks about the relevance of, of neuroscience in several contexts, partly to understand the attentional abilities and style in, in young children about how they're going to uh, engage with climate change content. Uh, the role of emotions, particularly negative emotions in, in learning, it, climate change being not an upbeat kind of thing. Uh, and then how cognitive neuroscience informs uh, which sorts of climate change pedagogies may be effective and why, and, and particularly a focus on personally relevant action. Uh, and, and he would summarize the contribution here as um, informing the teacher's reflective practice and, and empowering them to, to, to develop and adapt strategies um, uh, for specific contexts um, to promote learning and behavioral change. OK, so let's start with engagement. Uh, Paul talks about the distinction in um, attentional style. Now, that develops quite early on, but um, there are uh, cultural differences in attentional style that have been observed. For example, comparing uh, uh, a Western approach and an Eastern approach, so, so the UK versus Japan. Uh, the, in the UK, children are raised to have a kind of analytic or individual uh, attentional style focusing on a specific figure, uh, a fo an individual focus um, of, of a, a situation, uh, whereas an Eastern approach is more kind of holistic and is focusing more on the whole context, so the figure in, in a given background. And these are very subtle things and early developing um, differences, but they they have been these attentional styles, individual versus uh, sort of more holistic, have been associated with um, differences in uh, accepting the individual role uh, of, of humans in causing climate change. So there may be links between attentional styles um, and um, beliefs. Uh, Paul points to the enhanced sensitivity to social signals in adolescence, and that might explain why teenagers can respond differently to younger children about climate change information. Just think back to my indignation uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that, uh, oh, my parents had let us down. Um, 
Also, the emotional response to information, it, it can encourage or inhibit further processing and learning. So we can be curious, which in, uh, as, a, as an emotional response, which is engaging. But if we become anxious, that can cause us to uh, disengage. And then there's whether, whether we're doing this engagement in a peer context, in a social context, um, and the extent to which that makes the content personally uh, or emotionally relevant. Uh, there are some risks there that that um, uh, we can all of us have the belief that that um, the UK is only a small country and we're just one person in the UK. So how should anything I do make a contribution to this global problem? And that can cause uh, people to disengage um, from climate change content. And the response to that is to try and re-engage by recasting global problems as, as a series of local, more concrete and tackleable problems uh, where the individual, the, the student feels like they have some behavioral control over outcome. Hence, so you'll see that in, in the, the education initiatives to actually think about biodiversity on the school estate and getting children involved in doing actions actually in their school, um, which uh, enables them to see concrete consequences. Paul talks a little bit about um, the use of narrative to engage elaboration of factual content. So not just dry provision of facts, but visually vivid, action-based, emotionally charged content uh, can be more effective for engagement. Uh, now we get into this slightly thorny area of um, uh, negative emotions. Now, media messages, as we saw about climate change, are often couched in... Uh, negative uh, ways and sometimes as sensational it's part of the kind of clickbait uh, environment that we exist in in the media um, but it's a it's a complex uh, role of um, emotions in in engaging with with climate change content so negative emotions can prompt a state of vigilance they can cause us to focus our cognitive resource and to be ready uh, to respond to the, the threat, as it were. Uh, and there's some evidence. Morris et al. did a study with, uh, uh, gave um, students videos about climate change, which had negatively valenced endings. And those type, compared to the ones with positively valenced happy endings, tended to increase pro-environmental behavior. And at the same time, they were measuring kind of nervous system activity and found evidence that, that that kind of inducing negative emotions uh, encourages that kind of orienting reflex and a, and a state of um, vigilant readiness. So on that, from that perspective, the negative content is, is uh, can be helpful. But if you're inducing a kind of fear response without uh, giving the individual an opportunity to reduce the threat, that can prompt uh, withdrawal and produce anxiety. So one of the, the slightly tricky questions we need to think about in this area is the extent to which teachers should be ready to or be uh, comfortable with inducing negative emotions in their students as part of the pedagogy. So that's engagement. What about building? Well, some important factors here. One of them is, is that the, uh, the teachers can unconsciously transmit emotional responses to the content. It's not deliberate, but the way they talk about a content can influence learning. So if they themselves are anxious about the content, that, that can be transmitted to the students. But also uh, the confidence that, that the teacher is expressing in the content that they are teaching is also uh, readily absorbed by students. So um, in that context, Teachers should show confidence in the existence uh, uh, of climate change and facts relating to it uh, and display a personal, motivating and authentic emotional response. So the way you teach is going to be important in this context. Uh, it's important to connect the new learning with prior knowledge. And that's increasingly so if you're doing teaching for younger children who need scaffolding with that. So uh, a key challenge here is to make this kind of distant global nebulous threat of climate change personally relevant to individuals so you can think of activities such as 
uh, calculating one's own carbon footprint or activities such as uh, increasing the biodiversity of the school grounds by planting wild seeds, uh, wildflower seeds, for example. So I think part of it, the important aspect here is to use local contexts to help teach climate change content. So to build on familiar prior knowledge, uh, and that is the foundation to provide um, uh, the grounds for, for application of the knowledge and enactment. In terms of consolidation, doing actions uh, that follow on from the knowledge is an important way to consolidate it. And um, if you're going to have self-motivated behavioral change, that needs more than just understanding the facts. So it's it's important to couch this types of learning uh, in a um, in terms of personally relevant action. Now there is some neuroscience about that. I'm going to talk a little bit more in in the, the last section of the talk. Um, for example, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. I'll throw in some brain areas just to impress you. Um, that's thought to support. Um, imagining the future and then thinking about how that feels. So that contributes to what we might call affective foresight. So you're, you're sort of, if you render the future tangible, uh, that helps provide a basis for more kind of farsighted behavior. Um, and lastly, trying to think about positive outcomes and actually you planted the seeds for your wildflowers in your school grounds uh, in the autumn and you see them in the spring, that kind of positive outcome uh, provides self-affirmation. And there's, a, there's an intrinsic reward uh, of those kind of activities, uh, as well as an increase in, in well-being. So just to summarize uh, uh, Paul's paper, uh, he would argue the science of how we learn cannot prescribe a way of teaching climate change content that's going to work in all classes and all learners, uh, but it does illuminate the underlying and, and sometimes invisible processes that are involved. Um, and it also might provide insight into how and why a chosen approach may succeed or sometimes fail in practice. Uh, I'll just flash up this. I, I mentioned the work by Wolf and Lindbergh earlier. Uh, if you were going to put together a module on um, environmental neuroscience for undergraduates, what would go into that? Well, this is five years out of date, but but it's things like, yes, some neuroanatomy, but that would include uh, endocrine disruptors, things that, that affect your hormones, say, uh, um, uh things in the water, if your water isn't clean, for example, um, neural development and plasticity, pollution and neural tube defects, uh, the effect of lead on neural development, uh, neural basis of sensation and perception, um, application of biophilia, why the brain likes being in natural environments, sleep and circadian rhythms, how sleep can be disrupted, uh, the neural basis of motivation, emotion, and homeostasis. That's some examples um, of a more advanced uh, content. And uh, lastly on this, uh, a lot of people are thinking about how to develop pedagogies here. This is just one example of a paper from last year arguing to teach uh, sustainability content. You might emphasize uh, pedagogical approaches such as interactive engagement, active and collaborative learning and problem-based learning. Okay, last section to think about uh, causes of human behavior relevant to climate change. So um, this is part of this thinking about how the brain works and, and how that applies. Now, the, the, the assumptions of, of this book are that if you wanna understand how the mind works, you need to understand how the brain works. The brain works the way it does because of biology and biology works the way it does because of evolution. So this book actually starts from the point of evolution. So I'm, I'm going to try and do that here. Let's do some climate change from the point of view of evolution. Do we get anywhere on that? I don't think we really do here. So the human behaviors influencing global environment, you know, the climate system, biodiversity, don't seem to be directly related to brain anatomy. So I'm showing you a plot over on the right hand side here of um, across different um, uh, homonym species over the last 10 million years, how our size of brain has increased and we've got cleverer as a species and so forth. 
And there's a little call out panel here showing the last 100,000 years. And what I've added in blue on the top is uh, at what point did we start doing sort of damage to the global environment because of our behavior? And it's only in the last few hundred years, really. And, and brain anatomy hasn't changed in that time or the previous time. There were changes in the global environment, uh, but but um, humans and and their uh, ancestors tended to be victims of those changes, as as we'll see shortly. In a sense, this is good news because the the are uh, the human capacities that got us into this problem uh, can get us out of the problem. Specifically, they are things such as niche construction how we change the environment to, to support, you know, turn it into an environment that is preferable for us uh, so that you can find humans living in the Arctic Circle and in the desert and in the jungle. Uh, we do that through niche construction. Uh, to achieve that, we um, develop technology using our intelligence and social coordination and culture and so forth. So all those kind of aspects of human behavior hopefully will enable us to problem solve our way out of it. Should we feel bad about climate change having messed things up? Well, I'm not sure. Obviously, it's not good, is it? Um, but uh, in terms of, of evolution, it's the, that's what species do, right? I mean, elephants are notorious for, for damaging their environment. Here's a paper about that calls them big gray biodiversity thieves, right? They upset their habitat. Uh, and we know species, they don't plan ahead, right? That if there's a lot of predators, they eat all the prey available uh, and increase their numbers until there's not enough uh, prey left and there's a collapse in, in predator numbers and then the prey increase and then eventually there's this cycle going on. So almost uniquely amongst species, humans are able to plan. So we're in a better position uh, than all the other species who um, damage their uh, environment. This bit's a little bit worrying. If we look back at the previous human species, so Erectus, Heidelbergis, uh, Neanderthals, uh, and you you look at, at um, geological climate records, it looks like that climate change has contributed to the extinction of most of the previous human species. Like, Ugh. so, you know, it is something to worry about. In the past, that wasn't due to their behavior. It was due to natural changes in climate. Uh, and, and it's worth saying all that evolution, all these skills that humans have had, that is a feature of, of primate evolution. So if you look across a whole bunch of uh, primate species, you can see the gradual emergence of things like behavioral innovation, social learning, tool use, extractive foraging, tactical deception. So a lot of these skills, it's part of the way primates have been evolving. So all of that is like, I don't think we should feel too bad about it but uh you know we should recognize the threat um climate change in the past has actually spurred homonym evolution i don't think that's a good thing you know if evolution is happening that means your species isn't well fitted many of your species are not well fitted to your current environment so a lot of your species are not going to make it to the next generation and if you get into this evolution kind of doom laden approach here's a paper that says in the long run, we're all dead. 250 million years, the, the supercontinent's going to reassemble. It's all going to become too hot for mammals uh, uh, to exact. I know, scare stories. We don't need to pay attention to that kind of stuff. Let's move into uh, how the brain works. So just a kind of schematic of the sort of systems that are going to be relevant. So uh, sensory systems, motor and planning systems, somewhere in between those, we have things like meanings and concepts and scenarios. Uh, we have control processes so we can uh, make decisions and control what we're going to do. Uh, underneath that, we have like social systems that process other people, social hierarchies, trust how we feel about other people. We have these uh, kind of emotion systems like appetitive approach systems, uh, curiosity, interest. Do I want to go over and start talking to a person? Uh, aversive avoidance behavior, so threat detection, danger, that kind of thing. We have uh, empathy systems, disgust, that kind of bodily emotional basis. And then we have reward systems that are all about rewards and loss and risk and prediction of, of future outcomes. 
And underneath all of that, there's some basic stuff running the body and uh, generating smooth embodied action. So we've already heard this mentioned previously, but but you know, there's a thing humans do where we can disengage from our current perceptual environment uh, and we can uh, run scenarios in our head and then uh, we can see how we feel about that. Uh, so, oh, I would feel bad if that happened, if all the penguins drowned or something. Uh, <clears throat> and then we can use those scenarios to, to make decisions about what we're going to do next. Okay, so, I mean, the the brain is, the human brain is conceptually pretty powerful. So we can entertain complex concepts and models of causal processes in the world. Uh, we tend to prefer that to be in concrete sensory motor terms. So we also have kind of concrete metaphors to put our ideas on top of. So we talk about the world being on fire or about to fall off a cliff. These are sort of uh, sensory or concrete sensory instances to get across the idea of climate change. But then language plays a particular role here that, that we can talk about sort of abstract and invisible causes that can be producing the outcomes. We observe greenhouse gases like I can't see a greenhouse gas, right? We This is part of our uh, system of scientific knowledge, which talks about uh, all of these invisible causes. And there's a big evidence change in the history of natural sciences to believe all these things exist and so forth. And then we develop these causal models, these beliefs, and, and then we can use them to uh, change our behaviors. So you just have to convince people that, that uh, climate change is a problem and then everyone's going to change their behavior, except that doesn't really work. Why is that? Well, other things the brain is tailored for, particularly it's tailored for um, delivering adaptive motor behavior in response to sensory input in the moment right now. It's an embodied thing. Uh, how are we going to move and act uh, in the current perceptual situation? Uh when we think about climate change, that environmental impact of our behavior is often very distant in the future. It's abstract, it's probabilistic, and often it affects other people. The brain is mainly tuned to make to make decisions about what affects us personally in the current time and place and for outcomes that will definitely happen. So we can see a, a tension there. And then the decisions we make, yes, beliefs may well uh, go into that, but also they're influenced by emotions, reward histories, and social context. Now, if people are just not doing what you want them to do. If you're a government or you're a lobby group trying to uh, uh, save the environment, how are you going to manipulate people? Uh, you can use scare tactics, use threat, talk about tipping points and final wake up calls and last chance saloon and extinction act now. And you can see why that might be good that that's going to inspire quick, decisive action. So we heard in the previous section uh, from Paul Howard Jones about uh, producing negative emotions, they can spur people to action. So turn off the lights, turn down the thermostat, cycle, don't drive, go veggie, don't eat meat and so forth. The difficulty there is that if you engage the threat system, it does have unpredictable results and it may depend on individual differences. So aspects of uh, personality and people's previous experience and so forth. We'll, we'll come to that in a minute. So yes, flight behavior, sorry, fight behavior from the threat. You respond to the threat. That might be good. You might adjust, adjust the thermostat, turn down the temperature, but you might get flight behavior where people just don't like that um, negative, aggressive messaging. And, uh, you know, they stop paying attention, don't read the news on the environment. They don't like that anymore. Uh, they just really read the celebrity gossip pages in, in the magazine instead. Um, or freeze behavior, just bury your head in the sand and go, doomsday, I can't do anything, I'm going to give up, la, la, la. Or you might get a different sort of fight behavior where people get more really aggressive towards the senders of a message. Well, it's all just a conspiracy by the hidden state to manipulate us. I don't believe you get angry uh, with the people who are, who are using this messaging towards you. And we also know that threat induces anxiety. Uh, it may induce chronic anxiety or a sense of defeat. 
unless there are clear actions available to address the threat. We heard about that earlier. So yes, if you're going to message, use um, threat to, to uh, uh, framework your message, uh, it has to be personal, has to address, be addressed to you, but also be accompanied by concrete achievable plans that make sense in removing the threat. Uh, so you need to know exactly if I get an electric car, where are the charging points or how I can I use it? It's all got to be information that enables you to actually do things to get rid of the, the threat that are, that are personally relevant. We do have the, con the collective action problem. My contribution won't make a difference. And there, I think beliefs are important, uh, gaining an understanding that, that uh, if everyone does a small bit, it all adds together to um, a big outcome. Some of the very interesting work in this area has been applying research from neuroeconomics to um, uh, climate science, environmental energy and energy policy. So some great work by Nick Saw um, at uh, Stanford. And this is appealing to the work from neuroeconomics that uh, the um, reward uh, brain activation tends to predict consumer behavior rather than beliefs and that future rewards are discounted more than future losses. So neuroeconomics, what's that? It's it's about you know putting people in a brain scanner and seeing when you show them different types of adverts, what brain areas light up, which are likely, uh, which what brain activity is actually likely to produce future behavior. And that work suggests that consumer behavior, what they will do can be predicted by uh, the part of the, um, action selection system that uh, encodes positive rewards, in particular the nuclear accumbents. Um, so uh, if you show someone an advert and it really lights up their kind of positive reward center, that's a strong indicator that, that they'll go buy your product, right? And that beliefs about what's right and wrong actually seem to be weaker in driving decisions uh, than this powerful aspect of uh, anticipated future rewards. If you're cynical, you, you, your, the beliefs you talk about are just uh, post hoc justifications for what you really wanted, right? And, and the other finding that comes out of this research is that people tend to be short sighted about weighing immediate versus future benefits of their action. So, uh, should I buy a more expensive, fuel efficient car, even if after a year it will have paid back the difference that I paid more? Or should I pay £10,000 right now? Uh, to put solar panels on my house, even though in five years time, I'll be in profit and so forth. We, we tend to discount the future gains and focus more on, on um, the immediate gains. Uh, and, and this is a feature of our reward learning system that it is just tuned to be more suspicious about vague future rewards. It would rather have a, a bird in the hand than two in the bush. Uh, interestingly, that discounting is more for rewards, less so for losses. So there's a nice picture of a dying forest or a deforested area of the Amazon. We tend to not be bothered so much about how far in the future that forest is dead if it's dead next week or in five years. That, that feels more similarly bad. So here's an example of, of applying this kind of work um, uh, in an in um, environmental context. It's looking at um, consumer ads but also green ads where your product is um, uh, couched in, in its benefits for the environment. And this is a paper from 2017 showing that, that um, there seemed to be more of a dissociation of self-reported preferences uh, and the activation of the personally relevant value system for green advertisements than not for control advertisements. So saying that in another way, uh, the person may well, well say they like the green advert more, but their brain says that they don't. Uh, so that's a kind of application here of, of uh, neuroeconomics to, to um, climate change. This is a broader schematic. Don't worry about this detail. Uh, this is just to say that it's quite complicated in the brain about all the different parts of the brain that are encoding different types of value. So there's decision value and social value and reward value and um, emotion value. Uh, you can see this broken down a little bit more. I think this is my worst slide for names of brain areas. 
But we have this, the amygdala, which is about uh, um, being attracted to situations or running away from threat, aggression, curiosity, interest. We have the anterior insula that's going to encode uh, your kind of gut feelings, your emotional value of things, disgust, gets involved in empathy and pity. The septum that does social affiliation, affiliation and social reward, also involved in attachment. Hippocampus is this memory system doing snapshots of where good and bad things have happened. Anterior cingulate that monitors progress against goals and, and hopefully resolves conflicts. So like helps you solve quandaries about what you should do. Nuclear accumbens, we just heard, anticipated future rewards. Prefrontal cortex is making decisions, but those are of different types. So uh, the dorsolateral, uh, that's his... Uh, that is selecting goal relevant plans, potentially inhibiting your emotional response to do what you think is right. Uh, orbitofrontal, that's your gut feeling about um, emotions, reward, history to judge, risk, intuitions about how you should behave. A good thing's going to happen or a bad thing's going to happen. And the ventromedial, this seems to be this personally relevant value system. It's running cost benefit analysis of competing values to make a decision, uh, including social hierarchy, information, reward, history, trust, betrayal. That's a system we just saw in that um, neuroeconomics thing where, where people claim that they like green adverts, but this personally relevant value system was not being activated by that. Uh, empathy, do you care? I'll just give you a quick example of that anterior insula system. Um, Penguin numbers apparently are reducing due to melting ice. Do you care? Do you care about that? Well, here is a BBC um, uh, article on this from uh, last summer. Climate change. Thousands of penguins die in Antarctic ice breakup. Uh, catastrophic die off of emperor penguins. Uh, up to 10,000 young birds estimated to have been killed. The birds most likely drowned or froze to death. Uh, look at those cute little furry penguins and they're all drowned it's i can see so you can see there my anterior insula feeling empathy and pity and i just feel so bad for these cute little birds but here's an alternative version of of the graphic which i i created for your benefit uh which i started by just checking what is the uh, total population of emperor penguins in the antarctica and then plotting the change as a consequence of, of um, 10,000 dying. And, and then you get this graph, right? Uh, and then here's my brain lighting up with the intraparietal sulcus, which is processing quantity, right? And here, I'm not quite feeling so bad about these penguins. Now, you can see it's a tiny drop there, and they'll probably go up again next year. So this, this is just indicating about these different value systems are engaged differently depending on the context of the messaging. Uh, different brains, different messages. Now, um, all brains are not the same. Brains different intelligence and personality. I'm mainly going to focus on personality here. And this is differential tuning of emotion and reward systems. Depends on the size of the structure and, and the, the connections that have grown between them during development and some of the uh, neurotransmitter balances. Details not important, but here are all the different brain areas that are going to be tuned differently uh to to give you a different personality what you'll end up with is a, a whole brain that's more or less likely to experience certain emotions in certain situations more or less likely to make decisions based on emotional states versus plans and goals more or less likely to approach or avoid certain situations <clears throat> more or less likely to respond to other people in convivial ways or consider other people in decisions and a brain more or less likely to choose actions uh, that lead to certain kinds of rewards or experiences. Okay, the interesting thing here is, I need to hurry up to get to the end, uh, personality is actually linked to political leanings. Now, political leanings, there's more going in, there's concepts and your history of experiences and your knowledge about how governments behave. But very broadly, you can get, at the extremes, you can get <clears throat> fearful, disgust-sensitive, uncertainty aversive, change aversive, uh, brains with a preference for concrete and to be backward looking. Uh, and those that kind of personality constellation is associated with, with right wing, being right wing. 
And on the other end, you can get brains which are more empathetic, uncertainty tolerant, executive function dominance, are more kind of in control, consciously in control, open to abstractions and future looking. That tends, that constellation tends to be uh, associated with a, a, a left wing view. So if you want a message to those different audiences, same message, pro environmental uh, behavior. Uh, to the one type of brain, you would talk about a solid plan to, to secure old fashioned neighborhood conservation against climate threats. So it's all about security and concrete and backward looking and keep it all the same. But to the other type of brain, you might want to talk about an ambitious plan to achieve a future of global environmental balance through international cooperation and justice. It's all future looking abstraction in terms of uh, social uh, justice. So you have to talk to different brains in different ways, depending on whether what bra brains are more threat influenced or uh, justice influenced. Okay, try and wrap up in two minutes. Um, of course, that's all talking about our own decisions, but we have to think that that uh, we need to make decisions in favor of other people. That's talking about the pro-social brain. Uh, even we have to have the abstraction of future generations. Uh, there was actually a, a, a ruling by a court in Germany saying that the, a, a generation has to take into account uh, the consequences of their action for future generations. And, it, and it's unfair to put all the load on the future generations. So uh, then we have to think about um, how pro-social behaviors are rewarding. Uh, we have to deal with the conflict between self-interest and, and the interests of others actually giving to charity it is uh rewarding to do that uh but we require empathy and the ability to take other people's um perspective so we have issues like the importance of fairness of social norm violation cooperation these kind of aspects are feeding into our behavior i'll jump over these just just some of the literature looking at, at these aspects a key aspect is trust so let's say uh, if you discard plastic wrappings, that puts microplastics into rivers and the ocean, and that could harm fish and the subsequent food chain. It's like, yeah, says who? I mean, I've no direct experience of that. My belief of that relies on trust. That's a whole different area. Uh, some great work by Ulrika Han in, in uh, Birkbeck looking at people's trust and where it comes from and whether they uh, trust evidence and sources of um, authority. Trust actually comes in two forms. It's either conditional, earned. So you might trust scientists because their predictions about climate change from the 1990s turned out to be right. Or you could have unconditional trust. These are people who you are attached to. So you might want to recycle more if your favorite celebrity says to do it or your football team uh, endorses it. Uh, neural correlates of trust, as I say, difference between affiliation and uh, conditional trust based on a history of reward uh let's leap over these things other aspects of social so i'm just going to have six bits of advice for policymakers based on this neuroscience and then we'll conclude six lessons are social context is important social norms shame and guilt keep us in line in terms of our pro-environmental behavior if you want to use fear messaging that can have unpredictable results uh Either positive action, inaction, or rebellion. In the absence of a sense of control, it can induce anxiety and a sense of helplessness. So you need to accompany that messaging with uh, immediate personally relevant action plans that can lessen the threat. Uh, because we can discount, we discount future awards, you either need to emphasize future gains more, so better eco-labeling, bring forward rewards in time, so grants to insulate houses, or frame the future more in terms of potential losses. So like dying forests. Influence, uh, emphasize personal cons consequences, emphasize the trustworthiness of causal models and the authority of the evidence. The strongest lever that we have to influence people's future behavior is to elicit positive emotions rather than induce fear states or bribe them. Uh, and lastly, communication around climate change and sustainability needs to be tailored to different personalities. OK, so just to wrap up, you might complain what's neuroscience 
doing getting involved in this said this is a social problem neuroscience should butt out and i kind of agree with that i think people should just make up their minds based on the arguments and the facts and behave accordingly but we've seen that's not how people behave so i think neuroscience can offer insights into your own decisions to help you behave more rationally uh and maybe you can tell when you've been manipulated by lobby groups in the government that's a summary you've already heard it uh keep up the pressure on politicians without it uh, we won't get progress on climate policies and thanks for your attention and uh some acknowledgements and just a flag Birkbeck is launching its new center for environment and sustainability indeed it has a climate festival uh being held in march thanks so much for your attention everyone absolutely fantastic thank you so much michael um i also put some cut for Finbar's contribution in the uh, in the chat as well, so a big clap for him. Yeah. Um, so, have you got a couple of minutes for us to kind of yeah, ambush you yeah, with a couple I have of questions? As much time as you want. Brilliant. Okay, so um, anyone who has got any questions for Michael, um, pop them in the chat now. In the meantime, I will ask you um, the little tricky question that keeps coming to my mind. Um, so, I was thinking about your points about engagement disengagement and like negative emotions and threat and i was thinking about socioeconomic status right because obviously people children in more deprived conditions they might already be experiencing more more stress greater powerlessness um these kind of green options that make things more you know immediate and relevant to them are probably less accessible um and they might also be kind of like disproportionately affected by negative climate things like rising fuel prices and such. Um, so I guess my question is, is there anything kind of neuroscientific about SES effects on the brain that might kind of mediate these responses to climate uh, messages? Yeah, I mean, so that there, there are several different aspects to that. A very tricky question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so. Part of it is, is uh, tailoring your message. So to understand that that uh, um, children uh, in um, uh, backgrounds of, of poverty, not all of them, some of them uh, may be more uh, have heightened red, uh, heightened levels of anxiety and vigilance anyway. Uh, so that if you use threat messaging with them, that may not be um, uh, as effective. So to understand that that even in the same classroom, you are going to have uh, children who are going to hear that message differently. And I think that speaks to uh, the complexity of, of teachers having to think about should they induce negative emotions? They can be effective, but they can also be um, unpredictable. Uh, but I think just teaching content here and saying everything's great you can't do that either, right? Because everyone's going home and hearing all these scare stories in, in the media every day. So, I mean, that's that's part of this issue is negative emotions. And, and part of it is to understand um, uh, the differences between children and how they're going to hear the message. Uh, the other part is, is a much more kind of social thing um, that uh, the impacts of climate change are uneven globally. And, um, you know, in the UK, it's it's windy and rainy a bit now. It's not like too hot to survive. It's not like we've had a five-year drought and our crops have failed. Um, and uh, so we're, we're looking at education in, in very different contexts, potentially with much more um, proximal threats. Obviously, we're in, we're in a UK context, and there I think it's, it's really important to help children uh, empathize with how climate change is affecting people in different parts of the globe. And, and part of that is, is to bring it alive with the stories of, of other children in other schools around the world. And, and yes, it's useful to have a graph in maths class that is plotting uh, carbon dioxide concentration against global temperature. But, but that does need to be complemented that that has real consequences for, for people around the world, which are much more um, pressing than, than thinking about planting wildflowers on the playing fields. Right, thank you. That actually kind of really links to a question we've received in the chat. 
um, from Yelga. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, so Yelga asks, um, well, first of all, are you familiar with Ian McGilchrist's hemisphere hypothesis? Um, I'm not. No, there I'd you like go. To well, find out about it. The hemisphere he's, hypothesis. He's given you a link here and he asks, how could his research highlighting differences between hemispheres and their associated value systems inform climate education? So that was linking a little bit to what you were literally just saying about. If we're thing. talking about, is that brain hemispheres, left brain oh, or is right it? brain? Oh, I'm not sure. I wasn't sure if it was the uh, world hemispheres. Let me have a look. Or or is it global north versus global south? Um, so different hemispheres there um hello yes you want to say uh, oh yeah maybe too. yeah it's it's about the brain hemispheres and okay. uh, not the traditional research that has been done of it and has been debunked of course but more uh recent research of his uh, okay no i'd be very interested to look at that i'm i know um the the work on um differences between hemispheres if, if you're not looking in in kind of language areas which which mainly has relevance to, to aphasia in adults to be frank uh, but if you're looking developmentally it, it relates to attentional style and using global versus local contexts and, and figure ground distinctions and and, and um whether you're yeah you're that's under, very much in alignment listed. actually with yeah. what he writes about it's yeah. that is a difference yeah. in attentional style that has quite some consequences also uh, apparently through theory yeah so i yeah. certainly i was i was fascinated to read in in um uh paul howard jones work about about these uh, attentional differences that that um uh, are often aligned with different um cultural um, practices they're early developing but they do have consequences for uh children's learning and and uh, yeah i'd love to read more about about that literature okay great thank you i can uh, recommend thank Super, you so much yes put it in the chat and i'll follow the link yeah. great yeah Brilliant. Thank you for sharing. I love how the seminars bring other work that maybe you weren't familiar with to the forefront as well. Fantastic. Um, Ali just says, thank you. Thank you for discussing it from uh, an education or a science perspective. Very informative and thought provoking. Thanks. Um, and I think this may be our final question. So Matt Brooks just asks, will the presentation be made available publicly? Uh, we always upload the recordings to our YouTube channel. So if you look on YouTube, and search Center for Educational Neuroscience, you should find our YouTube channel and we normally try and get it up within a few days. Um, yeah, so any of the slides I skip through, obviously you can pause them and, and uh, have, a, have a look what's on there. Uh, yes, I, I couldn't upload it until I've gone through and checked for typos because I only just wrote it. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, see, thank you, Michael. Absolutely fantastic again. Thanks, thank thanks you for everyone. your time. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And we will see you again next week for another exciting CN seminar. See everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.